Welcome back to Barton EMS Education for the EMT. In this module, we're going to talk about altered mental status emergencies. This encompasses various different standards from the Kansas Board of EMS, talking about with our endocrine-related emergencies and our uh, types of emergencies dealing with strokes coming from the neurosystem, our neurology. So. I want to encompass all of these as altered mental status emergencies because that's kind of what they all have in common. And so when we're talking about emergencies dealing with mental status changes, when they change their LOC and we change that, we have an emergency. And why are we having an emergency? That's what we've got to find out. So let's figure out about these altered mental status emergencies and understand better about them so we can get understanding the material related to this. So we're going to talk about altered mental status emergencies dealing with syncope, what the heck is that, dehydration, diabetes, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, and diabetic ketoacidosis, seizures, and stroke. These are kind of our, my go-to altered mental status emergencies that an EMT must know. And remember, we're not going to cover all the signs and symptoms because where do you need to go? Yep, you remembered it, the Merck Manual. So go to the Merck Manual that's going to give you your signs and symptoms for all of these emergencies and you can get a better understanding of what you're going to be seeing out there in the field. So let me go ahead and move my, my screen here. So our syncopal cause, our syncopal episodes, we have different causes. But syncope is basically passing out and the person passes out. But why do they pass out? So over here we have a graph of, of different causes of syncope. Situational. They, they get so worked up and they pass out. And boom, they pass out down there on the floor. Or we don't know why they passed out. That's our unknown cause. That's a big chunk of the piece of the pie. Neural. There's a problem with the brain and why they're passing out. Orthostatic. Their blood pressure changed. They, they stood up so quick that the, the pressures changed and they couldn't manage it and keep that homeostasis and they passed out. They might have a cardiac arrhythmia or they might have an issue with their heart and their lungs. So the biggest cause that we see with syncope is a neural issue, an issue with the brain. So individuals who pass out, they don't just pass out because, oh, well, they just passed out. We need to look at all the other issues of how they passed out. So syncope is one that you need to kind of dive further into the rabbit hole to figure out what's going on and have that differential diagnosis. Now, let's talk about dehydration. Dehydration, because the human body is made up of 75% water, dehydration is an issue. If we become dehydrated, we lack in water substance inside the body, we're gonna start having warning signs. We're going to have an increased heart rate. We're going to have tachycardia. We're going to have joint and muscle pain. We might be tired. We might be just feeling blah. We might have constipation or digestive issues because the moment you start becoming dehydrated, the body starts to pull fluid away from your abdominal gut muscles and pulling it away so that you could continually hydrate your body. When we pee and we urinate and we see that the, the pee is yellow or starting to become really dark, it's not that we can't keep peeing or that we we're, we're have no water inside our body. It's because it's the lack of water and an increased concentrate. The more water you drink, the more diluted the concentrate is. That's why it appears clear. However, the less diluted the concentrate, the darker the color. And so what are some of the risks for dehydration is we can have heart issues with the risks of dehydration. We can also start getting kidney stones if we have chronic dehydration, severe constipation. We can have an altered mental status because the brain needs three things. The brain needs water, it needs oxygen, and it needs glucose. And with those things in mind, if we start to pull one of those away from the brain, the others are going to have to compensate. And so we're going to need to use more sugar and we're going to need to use more oxygen. And so you may see that the person may have uh, to have an increased heart rate to maintain that homeostasis. 
So dehydration is an issue. If you see someone with dehydration, we're gonna look for that skin turgor where we're gonna pull up and it's gonna stay tenting. They might have a dry furrowed tongue and you could see that on their tongue when you ask them to stick it out. They might have a low blood pressure and they may also have a high blood pressure because their body is trying to compensate. And so when fluids are given from an ALS standpoint, those individuals will start to get better and now they're not having as many issues. So dehydration is another one of our issues that we see with altered mental status emergencies. Now comes one of the big ones that we deal with. We deal with diabetes of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. I'm going to cover that up. Now we're first going to talk about in this one hypoglycemia. Now we need to keep the differences between the types of diabetes and then how they're presenting. So the types of diabetes, we have type 1 and type 2, but that's not where it stops. We can have individuals who are in between type 1 and type 2 and be 1.5. We can have individuals who have gestational diabetes that they only have diabetes while they're pregnant with a child. But how they present to us, they're either hypoglycemic or they're hyperglycemic. So you can have a type 1 diabetic who is hypoglycemic and you can have a type 1 diabetic who's hyperglycemic. You can have a type 2 diabetic who's hypoglycemic and you can have a type 2 diabetic that's hyperglycemic. It's not that type 2 or type 1 is only going to fall to one side or the other. It's how they absorb the sugar by using the insulin. Type 1 diabetes is insulin deficient. The pancreas is not creating enough insulin, which insulin is the key that goes into the door, unlocks, and the door swings wide open and allows the sugar to enter into the cell to be used for energy. However, in type 2 diabetes, we have insulin resistance that stops the insulin key from getting in there, and so the sugar continues to circle around, circle around the bloodstream. So we have to understand these two differences. So type 1 diabetes is our insulin deficient. The pancreas basically is shut down. However, type 2 diabetes is our insulin resistant, where it says stop insulin, you can't get through. But they both can present with hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Emia being in the blood, glyc being sugar, and hypo meaning low. So when you have someone who is hypoglycemic, they're going to be tachycardic. They might be irritable, restless. They might be hungry. They're sweaty. They're pale. Uh... And we, we see all these things with the individuals with hypoglycemia. Our two main treatments for these individuals is going to be glucose if they can swallow and follow commands. However, if they can't and their blood sugar is low and they're having issues from it, that's what we're going to think about giving glucagon. And glucagon is going to be our intramuscular drug at gluca 1, gluca 1 milligram intramuscular in one area of the body, whether it's shoulder, thigh, buttocks. Uh, any one of those issues of those areas. Now, our, our other places we're going to look at for issues in diabetes is going to be hyperglycemia. So we had hypo, which was low. This one now we're looking at is hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is now they have dry skin, so they're, they're usually red in the face. They're, um, they have dry skin. Uh, they're not sweating as much. They have excessive hunger excessive thirst, and excessive urination. We call these the polys, polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. They have a high blood sugar. High blood sugar normally above 250 is what the American Diabetes Association calls hyperglycemia. And we, we tend to look at the ranges of blood sugar, and that alone is changing every year due to research. But hyperglycemia presents with these issues and it's because they're not getting the sugar out of the bloodstream. That's why they've got to eat. They're, they're needing to dilute the sugar that's in their body. And so they're drinking more water. And they're trying to get rid of the concentrate by peeing it out, the amount of sugar out of their body, trying to maintain that homeostasis. But I understand that if we don't take care of this, and we're going to lead to the individual going into what we call diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis happens when the blood sugar gets to a high range, stays there for an extended period of time, and the individual has the lack of insulin to 
drive the sugar into the cell and so they start presenting with a low blood pressure they're tachycardic they're acidotic they're going into a form of what could almost be shock eventually and they they have breathing that is irregular and their their breath is going to smell acetone like like nail polish remover and you're going to know it when you smell it and these individuals again have an altered mental status so this is a high blood sugar issue that has lasted for a long amount of time now you can have diabetic ketoacidosis in a type 1 and it will present very similar in a type 2 diabetic but a type 2 diabetic is probably not going to have your ketoacidosis they're going to have what's called HHNS hyperosmolar uh, non-ketotic syndrome where basically the long and the short of it is they have diabetic ketoacidosis without the smelly breath that's the that's that's the main issue and that smelly breath comes from the amount of ketones that is increased inside the body now that finishes up our endocrine that finishes up a little bit of the neuro with the syncope and the dehydration but let's also talk about more neuro with seizures and stroke. So let me go ahead and move my screen over here. So we have, we have issues with individuals who have seizures. Seizures can be an actual medical emergency. That is the actual condition that they have. But seizures can also be just a symptom or not a symptom, a sign of something else going on inside the body. So our main seizure, our, our generalized seizure that we, we look at, what we call grand mal or a tonic-clonic seizure, is where we, we start out with the aura phase where we know that something's going to be happening. The individual knows that something's going to start, and then they go into the tonic phase where they start having the, the muscular contractions and they get really tight and they get rigid. And the clonic phase where they start shaking. And they're starting to clone themselves, if you will. They're, they're cloning themselves and they're, they're in the clonic phase. And then finally, their postictal phase with all of that energy and that work that they've had to do through those various phases of the seizures with the tonic clonic phase, we will have a postictal. But a partial seizure doesn't have all of the phases. It's partial. So we either have a tonic phase, we either have a clonic phase, um, or we have some other issues where we have an absence seizure. An absence seizure is where they basically just, oh, I'm sorry, you thought the video paused. The absence seizure is where they, oh, I'm sorry, again. The absence seizure is where they, they lose that ability that you can't see, they, they seem like they've dazed off, that everything has just been pressed, pause, play. And it continually happens to them. It can happen several, several, several times a day. And it, it's first going to get seen in your children in the school system when they get to that school age child because they're going to wonder why they keep becoming this uh, off in la-la land kind of look on their face. But seizures happen in the brain. It can also be in the brain due to a, a brain issue. It can be an electrolyte issue. It can be other uh, issues inside the body dealing with hormones. But seizures can be an actual medical problem due to a disease process. It can be a symptom. But understanding seizures, we need to know that our treatment for seizures is just maintaining airway breathing circulation. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about with dealing with neuro is strokes. Strokes are very important to understand. Now, I just did a continuing education that they were talking about with strokes that the individuals who have strokes, they're starting to go away from calling it cerebrovascular accidents, a CVA. But it's still important to know that that's what we used to call it. Now, strokes, strokes are important to understand because there is two reasons we have a stroke. We either have an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic strokes can occur from trauma or can occur from vessels that have become ballooned over time with an aneurysm that has burst and that is a hemorrhagic stroke and so there's a blow in the vessel an ischemic stroke clot there is a clot that has traveled to the brain either it's formed in the brain that would be a thrombus or it has moved to the brain and that's called a embolus and so we need to understand that with strokes 
we're going to have that hemiparesis or the hemiparalysis. The paralysis is going to be they, they can't even move that side. Hemiparesis is going to be that weakness on one side. Hemi meaning half. So they either have half weakness or half no movement paralysis. And we need to understand that we need to do a good stroke assessment. That's where we're going to look at their face for symmetry. We're going to see if they can feel either side. They're going to hear on either side. We're going to do a four-point eye exam. We're going to have them stick their arms out and see if we have one drop. And if we have an issue on the left side, it means it's the right brain. And if we have an issue on the right side, it's going to be the left brain. So right side, left brain, left side, right brain. And those issues with the stroke, time is of the essence. Time is brain. So we got to look at the face for symmetry. We're going to check their arms. We're going to have them say a simple phrase like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The sky is blue in Cincinnati. Um, the, the paramedics are wearing blue t-shirts. And the, the, when was the time that they called 911? When, did they, when were they last known normal? What exact time was that? And then when did they first start, start noticing signs and symptoms of this stroke? And so we're going to look at the stroke, and then we're going to let the hospital know that this is a code red. And how many symptoms do you have to need or signs do you have to need to be a stroke? One. And pull that trigger because it's time to get this person to the hospital and get them an emergency CT scan so that they can get the care that they need for the strokes. So get that emergency T, take them to the CT scanner, get that stroke taken care of, and get them the care they need because it, time is of the essence. Because if we have a stroke and we get them there in, in less than three hours, they can give them a clot buster drug that is going to help them get away from that clot and reperfuse the brain so we do not have infarction in the brain and we have that ischemic brain, we can allow it to reperfuse and we, we don't have as many deficits. I hope this was informative for you guys. I, again, enjoy always helping you guys prepare for these exams. Stay tuned for the rest of the, the topics. But now we've covered altered mental status emergencies from the endocrine system, talking about diabetes, to uh, our balances of fluid inside the body with dehydration and syncope, and as well as talking about neural problems with neurology with seizures and strokes. So good luck on your exam and take care.